tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe. Hey there, friend. I knew for sure you'd be here tonight. Google says it's National Never Give Up Day, so it'd be a hell of a stunt for you to give up on me and Chester tonight. On a day like this, hell, I might even take it personally. Hungry again, Chester? Unbelievable. You know, friend, for only $5 a month, the price of your fancy frappuccino, you can help feed poor hungry alligators like Chester every month. Just visit patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood and enjoy the Drew and Jeff show, additional narrations, and most importantly, friends, feed a child in need for only pennies a day. Hey, look, I'm no Sally Strutters, but she can't read horror for shit. Ah, come on in, friend. Mm. All right. So tonight we welcome back our pal DJ Montano. You remember him, don't you? The Big Till Day, author of Killer Queen, The Oriental, The Hanging Tree, and who could forget Frozen Souls, right? Hell, I could have been the seventh Monty Python with that one. <laughs> okay, so smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, my friends. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. So tonight, we join Claire, who's become a prisoner in her own home with no way to escape. So without further delay, I give you, from author DJ the Big Tilde Montano, the well. One. Welcome home. Looking out the cold stone shaft from the bottom of our dried up well. Never knowing when my papa would fish me out was always the worst of the punishments. If he had one too many beers, he may forget about me for the night. If he went on a bender, it would be days. Sitting with my knees pulled up into my chest and staring up at the small circular window of the sky I always felt like this would be the time he didn't come back. Eventually, Papa would lower the bucket and raise me. Being locked in the barn or the chicken coop always gave me anxiety, but anything is better than being at the bottom of that damn well. Papa knew I hated the well more than any of his other punishments. The pungent aroma of hay and black vertical bands covering the windows were only a fraction of the nightmare Claire woke to. Swollen veins in her temples throbbing violently, she squeezed her eyelids against the pulsating in the back of her eye sockets. She pushed her hands into the plush area rug, forcing herself up into a seated position. Brushing the untamed mess of auburn hair out from in front of her blurry vision, her legs struggled to get her off the ground. The room spun and she wobbled like a newborn giraffe. She stumbled to the couch to brace herself. How did I get to the floor in the first place? Why was I unconscious? Where are Dante and Bonnie? Her mind waded through the fog as she scanned the dusky room for clues. She patted her jean pockets and chest, instinctively hunting for her cell phone. Nothing. Beads of sweat formed on her head, and her breath caught in her throat as she looked around to see one of her childhood punishments recreated in her home. 
She tried rubbing her nose to remove the hay stench, but it was everywhere. The softly muted light poured in and shone like early evening. Thick dark bands blocked sections of the light attempting to fill the house. When her legs solidified beneath her, she walked over to the window that faced the setting sun. As she peered out through the wooden plank screwed into the top and bottom of the window sill, the world looked drab, like it was a grayscale picture. She looked out over the side yard that butted up against the tree line of towering ponderosas, Douglas firs, and white pines of the forest. It was hard to make out details through the slivers in the wood barring her in, and the dense fog outside. Her heart skipped a beat and her stomach nodded as a sudden reality hit her. She turned around and ran past the couch, turning to the right so hard she barely avoided slipping on the entryway tile. Unable to slow down, she crashed into the front door. Unmoved by the collision, she swung the mahogany wood door open and found the doorway blocked by ten boards about eight inches wide. She threw her body weight at them, but the barricade didn't yield. It took her a moment to notice the note stapled to a wood plank. Look on the counter, the note read. Staggering over to the counter, rubbing her shoulder from attempting to ram through the door, she found a piece of parchment stationery with a note written in elegant calligraphy. It looked odd to her like it was an object from another time that got dropped into her modern world. She let go of a breath she hadn't realized she had been holding and picked up the letter. Dear Claire, The water service in the house has been shut off from the outside. I left five gallons of water in the fridge. I took the liberty of stocking the cupboards. When you run out of the water... The only other source is the well outside the front door. Time after time, you drank from a forbidden cup and showed no remorse. You have been judged and sentenced. I will be watching you discover why you are here and what you have done to earn this fate. I know this seems cruel, but it is necessary to prevent you from spreading your sickness into the world. Your father was right to lock you up in the barn and lower you into the well. You clearly do not understand the value of morals, decency, or respect. Through your debauchery, you discarded all the things you claim to hold near and dear to your heart. Your suffering will feed my soul. Good luck. The Watcher P.S. There is no escape from your judgment. But please try. Her heart raced as she read over the letter again. How does this, this watcher know about my father and his punishments when I was a child? My debauchery. More and more questions popped into her mind, threatening to paralyze her right here and now. Those are questions I can answer after breaking out and finding my kids. Come on, Claire, get your ass in gear and get the hell out of here. She looked for weaknesses around the doorframe and found none. She stood on her tiptoes to see out the small peephole on the boards. Peering outside, a thick blanket of fog shrouded everything. In the distance, she could make out the stone well she hated when they bought the property. She remembered her revulsion seeing it and telling her husband Clark she wanted it dismantled, but he convinced her to simply cover it. She tried pushing on the wooden slats once more, but they wouldn't budge. She passed the table and caught sight of the note once more. The handwriting looked familiar somehow. Like a word stuck on the tip of your tongue you can't get your hands on. Claire scanned the document a third and fourth time to be sure what she had read was real, the pounding in her head made it difficult to lock onto her thoughts. She inspected the fridge and found five individual gallons of Food Co. brand water. The Watcher. Where did she know that name from? The fog in her mind was thicker than mud as she struggled to rein in her racing thoughts. She shook her head, attempting to regain focus. 
Next, she scanned the cupboards and found them full of bread, pasta, cookies, crackers, and chips. Inside a drawer in the fridge, she noticed a fresh bag of sliced sharp cheddar from Giamatti's Deli, a favorite of hers for years. Claire steadied herself using the marble countertops as she left the kitchen. Eyes straight ahead, staring off into nothing. Feet, taking each fumbling step, guided more out of memory than purpose. She plopped down on the leather love seat and tried to rein in her stampeding mind. Her eyes darted around as quickly as her mind jumped from idea to question to disbelief at a dizzying pace. Whoever had done this couldn't know her house better than her, right? Beads of sweat clung to her furrowed brow as she thought of ways to escape. Springing up off the couch, she left the living room and walked down the hall. Pictures of her family and her children's cherished childhood art pieces lined both sides. Her pace quickened as she moved towards the back of the house and approached the door to the garage, hoping this had been overlooked. Someone has my kids, and who knows what they are doing to them. Claire opened the door to the garage and found an empty void. No cars, tools, or anything of real significance. She slapped the wall where the garage door opener was located and the familiar sound of the motor started. A tremendous sigh left her and sudden relief quelled the feeling in the pit of her stomach. After a long minute with her eyes closed in relief, she opened them to find the garage door still closed. Confused, she hit the button again. The motor turned on again, but the door remained motionless. She looked up to see the gear turning without a chain. The rapid clicks of her shoes matched the rapid pace of her heart as she ran to the enormous steel alloy door. She bent down and grabbed one of the structural supports spanning the width of the door. The motor had failed on Claire before, and she called Clark, chewing his ass out about how he had promised to fix the door motor before he left on his next work assignment. He explained the system of pulleys and counterbalance weights and how it could be raised and lowered by picking it up. Even with the aid of the pulley and counterweight, she had struggled to lift it. Clark had insisted on getting a heavy, sturdy door for added security. Claire had set the phone down and lifted it successfully back then. Her mind clamped down on that hope. Gripping the support tightly, she used the sum of her whole being to will the door open. Her back muscles strained and her hands ached as the door bit into her delicate flesh. The door barely creaked at the effort. It didn't budge. She looked at the door incredulously. Why won't you open? She said. Her eyes scanned the door looking for the pulley's connection. Her heart plummeted at the sight of small frayed cable wires sticking out of the attachment point. Exhausted, she spun around and braced herself against the door. Her eyes combed their way across the room for anything that would help free her from her home. Sitting against the aluminum door, her head hung down between her knees. What now? What other small exits might have possibly gone unnoticed, she thought. There was one, and she bolted back into the house toward the basement door. A small cramped window led outside, and she just might fit through it. Making a right turn out of the garage door, her arm extended for the door handle. She never liked that the basement staircase was directly beneath the main staircase. It was a poor layout design since the basement had exterior doors too. She would have rather had a closet for coats and shoes since the garage was right there but her grin said everything about how happy she was to have it right now. She was sure they would block the outside doors, but she hoped the window had avoided the attention of the watcher. Her hand met the handle with an instantaneous turn and push. A loud smack startled her when she realized her face met with an abrupt stop. The sturdy chain lock on the other side gave about three inches and then jerked to a stop. It happened so fast that Claire wasn't sure she had hit the door until her cheek began throbbing. The panic crept back in, 
lungs puffing short, rapid bits of air. <laughs> Shit! What the hell? That chain wasn't there before. Or was it? Her voice trailed off down the hall. She tried slamming her weight against the chain door to no avail. She placed a hand on her chest, trying to steady her racing heart. Her eyes darted around, determined not to give in to her fear, but she couldn't avoid the pit that was growing in her stomach. The basement window wasn't an option, and there wouldn't be very many other options overlooked. Window by window and door by door, Claire worked her way through the first floor. What she found at every exit was boards replicating the barn wall. She scurried between exits, trying not to run for fear it would send her panicking mind off a cliff. She moved through the house and found all potential exits to be a dead end. Ripping drawers open, she looked for an old cell phone or means of communicating with the outside world to call for help. She found none. Her mind was gaining clarity. As her predicament crystallized, fear clutched her by the throat and squeezed. She surveyed the rest of the house, concluding that nothing else had been disturbed. Pictures hung on the walls, knickknacks stood in their proper places. Hell, minus the tons of hay on the floor, everything else is immaculate, she thought. What kind of person cleans up a house they are about to trap someone in? As we drove up, I remember seeing the door was wide open. I told the kids to stay in the car while I take a look. It's just fuzzy after that. Pressing the button on the 65-inch wall-mounted TV caused static to burst out of the speakers and fill the screen with white and black snow. Startled by the intense hiss, she quickly shielded her ears against the barrage. Locating the power button again, she shut it off. Peering around the back of the TV, she noticed the cable cord had been cut clean off. Up the half-mile dirt driveway and tucked back in the trees, the house was an island in the forest. On a normal day, it was a comfortable 20-minute drive from the city, but now she may as well be on the moon. She was alone. 2. Don't Panic being a stay-at-home wife had never felt isolating to Claire. Getting the kids up and ready for school and going over two sets of homework each night and preparing meals kept her busy when the kids were younger. As they grew into being capably independent, she searched for hobbies to occupy her mind. It seemed like every other housewife she met had a persona they put up. Yoga classes at the gym or wives clubs at the country club and even wives' groups on social media became gossip forums. They all feigned politeness in the beginning, but eventually they would become judgmental or condescending comments. It must be so easy with how much your husband makes and two kids that can get themselves ready each day, or some variation of that same sentence would be spat in her face at least once a week. In time, she grew tired of dealing with the fake snobby bitches and retreated back to her home. She had always considered Clark's ability to provide for them by himself to be a blessing, and she always felt a little socially awkward. Now, when she wanted to be out there in the world, she was trapped in her own home. No BFF was going to come looking for her. She didn't have a boss to be curious about her absenteeism. Claire's heart had not stopped racing since her first glimpse out the front door when she looked upon the well she had loved when they first purchased the house. She lowered herself unsteadily onto the couch. Beads of sweat peppered her head. Sitting alone in her house rubbing her hands together, she wondered where her kids were and if there was anyone who might have a reason to come to the house. She couldn't recall how long it had been since Clark left for his work assignment in Phoenix. Something about two weeks stuck out in her mind. Had he been gone for two weeks or had the two-week trip just started? She rubbed her temples trying to reel in the panic and force the memory to the front of her mind. This house had once been full of laughter, children's clumsy footsteps up and down the staircase, 
marital arguments, and great makeup sex. There had been some knockdown, drag out sibling wars, too. Now the silence ached. It hurt her ears, made her head throb, and pressed in on her whole body like being at the bottom of a deep pool. Her voice cut through the air like a sword. Okay, Claire, you're going to get up and figure out a way to get out of this shit. It was all she could think to do to feel less alone. The house was now an oppressive dark entity, and it would consume her if she didn't do something. She sat on the couch and wound the survival radio that was in a box of old toys left in the garage. They had given it to Dante for his 12th birthday, when he was obsessed with zombie movies and said it was a matter of time before it happened. He begged his parents for a sword, a radio, and a survival backpack he had found online. They found good deals on the radio and backpack. His face illuminated with joy as he tore the paper off each present. Dante could hardly contain the excitement for a long and narrow box his parents insisted he opened last. Promise me you'll be careful with this last one, Dante, she warned, just before he tore in. Dante gave a slight nod as wrapping paper flew off the box. He pulled the lid off to tissue paper blocking the beauty of his gift. Casting the tissue paper aside, Dante found a long-barreled pellet gun with a cedar stock and a three-inch pocket knife. Dante deflated at the sight. What's wrong, Dante? I thought it was a sword. Disappointment oozed out of each word from Dante. Sorry, son, but you're crazy if you think we're going to give you a two-foot-long blade, Claire said, crushing her son's dreams. We can't have you going around and killing people, now can we? Clark said rhetorically. Her fingers began to sting as the wind-up handle rubbed her finger raw. She turned on the radio and searched the AM airways for a local station. Static and white noise rose and fell as her finger rolled the slider down the station bar. Whistles and screeches came through in abundance until she heard smooth yacht rock in the form of Michael McDonald singing minute by minute. She rolled her eyes. Jeez, as if I needed a reminder that time is slowly ticking by. As she was just about to change it, the DJ cut the ending off the song. Ladies and gentlemen, we are interrupting programming at the request of the Coeur d'Alene PD. The police are looking for Susie Sato. She is an Asian American woman standing about 5 feet 4 inches. Black hair, brown eyes with a slim build, around 110 pounds. She's been missing for two days. The police suspect she is a victim of the Watcher. The Watcher is a serial killer and victims have been found in seven different states. His murders always entail some form of perceived immorality by the victim. Susie was a dancer at a local gentleman's club. If anyone has any information, please contact the Silent Witness Hotline at 1-800-948-6377. That's 1-800-WITNESS. Claire shut the radio off as some 80s one-hit wonder came on. She was startled to find out the Watcher had not only taken her, but another woman as well. How were they connected? Dante is dating a Susie, but she was no pole dancer. She was on a full-ride scholarship and attending college. She was sure Dante's Susie had a different last name. She had never been to a gentleman's club, and neither had Susie as far as she knew. Immorality of the victims and strange punishments, none of it made sense to her. Without realizing it, she had been pacing the living room. The pacing wasn't nervous pacing, even though she was nervous. Hell, she was terrified. She snapped back to the present and felt her bladder about to burst, and she ran toward the bathroom across from the garage door. Fumbling with the button on her jeans while gracelessly doing the potty dance, she squeezed against her bladder with everything she could. Finally, the denim slip found the button and parted ways just in time to get them down before she made a soaking wet mess of her pants. Relief washed into her body as urine finally flowed. With the ghostly sensation of a full bladder remaining, she flushed the toilet. She turned the sink handle, but only a few drops trickled out the spout. It was then that she noticed the absence of a familiar sound, the tank filling with water. Shit! 
This house is going to smell pretty bad with only one flush per toilet. Well, none left on this one. Exiting the bathroom, she came to a horrible realization. This place was intentional. That could only mean that something must have happened to her husband and kids. Clark always had to travel for work. The cutting-edge pharmaceutical industry often required traveling to attend lectures and symposiums about stuff 90% of people would never understand. Had he been traveling before all of this? Her thoughts were jumbled. Had he? Or maybe the Watcher had killed him already and she just couldn't recall it. Things were starting to appear on that blank chalkboard in her mind, but not the things she needed and not fast enough. Whatever drug she had been given, the effect was quite powerful. She couldn't remember a time in her life where she felt this helpless. Standing in the living room, Claire began looking for comfort to calm her scared and scattered mind. She walked over to the wall and scanned frozen fragments in time. Two pictures hung on the left side of a large family picture. Her son and daughter, each in a diaper with a chubby-cheeked smile full of life and innocence. The next sliver in time, Dante and Bonnie were around grade school age, with hope and joy staring back at her. Where had the years gone? Did she take time for granted? On the right side of the wall saw a young bride who stared into the eyes of her husband and saw endless happiness and possibilities. She couldn't help but look from that picture to the family portrait taken earlier that year. The slender but strapping face of her son Dante matched his father's quite closely. He was a bit on the smaller side until he discovered high school athletics and the gym. Dante was never the best on the field, but he made up for it with intensity. His passion boiled over and led veins bulging in foreheads and shouting into the face of his coach. The argument was punctuated by the kicking of a locker door after being kicked off the team. Despite the flare-ups, her son was a fine boy. He wore a smile that she knew to be disingenuous, pacifying his mother's need to always take pictures. Beside him was a beautiful young woman with a natural glow about her. This was her daughter, Bonnie. Bonnie had always been a gentler soul than Dante. Her slim oval face was the middle ground between her mother and father. Displaying her mother's long auburn hair but her father's haunting amber eye color, she was like a demigod. Someone special and set apart from the average looking person. She believed in love at first sight and had always hoped for her Disney princess or notebook type of true love calling. Despite life not being a fairy tale thus far, as a junior in high school she had time to meet her high school sweetheart and get her happily ever after. Or did she? Claire began looking at the pictures to soothe her, but now so many new questions circulated on a dizzying carousel. Were Dante and Bonnie okay? Was Clark okay? Who did this to her? How would she get out? Round and round the questions went with no end in sight. Trying to regain control of her mind, she set herself to trying to break out. Searching the house for the next hour, she found items that might help her. An eight-ounce meat tenderizing hammer, the cheap metal poker set from the fireplace at the cabin, and a heavy antique wooden coat rack. She felt him watching everywhere she went in the house. Nothing was out of place, though. What am I expecting? Cartoonish eye holes cutting pictures or paintings? No hidden passages or trick walls like a creepy mansion on a Scooby-Doo episode here. Claire stood six inches away from the wood blocking the front door. Gripping the tenderizing hammer in her right hand, Tight enough to make her fingers turn white, she swung hard. The hammer hit clumsily and didn't transfer the force of the swing as intended. After a few more failed attempts, she began to find a rhythm. Each time the aluminum hammer thundered against the wood, only a squared-off pattern of dimples remained. The pounding continued until her right hand got tired, then switched to her left. 
Not so much as an eighth of an inch gap had formed from her ceaseless hammering. When the muscles and ligaments in her hand began to fail from fatigue, she realized how out of breath she was. Sweat was dripping off her forehead and arms. Stepping back to lean against the arm of the couch and catch her breath, pregnant drops of sweat rolled down her back, growing larger with each small bead of sweat it collected along the way. It caused a chill to scurry up her spine, leaving goose flesh in its wake. Her hands throbbed from the repeated hammering. At this rate, her hands would fall off before she made any noticeable progress. The strained effort had given her cotton mouth, and she poured a glass of ice-cold water. The frigid water gave her goosebumps all over again. She started to pour a second glass, then jerked to a stop. She looked down at the half-full glass. This is all the water I have. Better make it last. The next couple of hours passed with various attempts to loosen the same boards with no avail. Two of the fire pokers were turned into large horseshoes when she tried using them as pry bars. She realized the boards were not simply nailed in, but screwed into the studs deep. Jesus, a tornado could hit this place and it would probably be the tornado that got the worst of it, she thought. 3. Get a grip. Claire collapsed into a chair at the dinner table, shoulders slumped forward, her body ached in ways it never had before. A belabored groan from her stomach reminded her that she hadn't eaten at all. Am I just supposed to make dinner and eat at the table like normal? Thankfully, the electricity to the house was still on. The wood slats covering all the windows made the house feel oppressive and dark. She poured some water into a pot and turned the dial on the stove to high. Soon, the element of the stove glowed cherry red, causing steam to float out of the pot. She grabbed a box of ziti and a can of tomato sauce. She poured half the box in and began stirring softly and spacing out. The silence hurt her ears. The TV was usually on, or one of the kids stood in the kitchen talking to her as she cooked. She put the strainer in the sink and poured the pasta into it. As she watched the water slip through the strainer, that wasn't just excess water going down the drain, that was also time. The faster she burned through her water, the less time she had to escape. After eating her plain pasta with tomato sauce, Claire winced with each step as she climbed the stairs and tried to lay down like it was just a normal night. The physical and mental stress of the day could be felt in every fiber of her being. She walked into the master bathroom and turned the hot water to the tub on. A couple of drops fell to the porcelain and ran down the drain. A heavy sigh echoed in the still air, and she hung her head and walked back into the room. After she changed, she told herself after a good night of rest, her mind would be clearer, and she could formulate a new plan to free herself. She tossed and turned, but to her relief, the exhaustion hurried her to sleep. Claire was woken by the television downstairs blaring at full volume. Taking a minute to get her bearings, she rolled out of bed. An involuntary groan jumped out as her full body weight hit her legs. It was worse than the first time she tried to crossfit. Shoulders throbbed, legs felt wooden and stiff, and her lower back muscles burned. She hobbled her way across the room and out of her bedroom door and gripped the banister with her right hand. Pain from muscles in her hand she didn't even know she had stung like crazy. She shuffled her way to the staircase and eased her way downstairs. She peeked around the corner to the right at the bottom and found the living room empty, treading like the floor was made of eggshells and wincing with each step, she made it to the couch and collapsed into it. Claire grabbed the remote control and hit the power button. A static sound cut in for a half second and the channel flipped to a news reporter standing in front of a house that was taped off with police cars in the background. The red and blue lights cast mutilated shadows across the neighborhood in the dark. Her eyes were drawn to the line on the bottom of the screen. It read, 
The watcher adds another to his body count. The scene inside this quiet suburban home is one of horror, Jack. The reporter began. Forty-two-year-old Fred Tarkovsky was found dead in his home. The cause of death was an apparent overdose on heroin. Family and friends say that Fred never had drug problems, and they would never have expected to find him like this after filing a missing persons report two weeks ago. Police searched the house less than 24 hours ago and found nothing. A neighbor saw a shadowy figure leaving the house around 4 a.m. Fred was found tied up into a kneeling position holding the syringe. The police believe this homicide is tied to the nationwide body count for the watcher. Police are advising people to be on the lookout for any suspicious people and don't travel anywhere alone when possible. For Channel 7 News, this is Stacy Salinger. Back to you, Jack. The channel flipped. Claire turned and looked at the remote like she was looking at a live rattlesnake. Was the controller malfunctioning? It hadn't turned off for her. The next report revealed that Fred had two hard drives of child pornography hidden in his dresser. A speechless wife stood before the camera, unable to breathe, let alone talk. The channel flipped once more, and a priest who had been sleeping with some of the wives from his parish was found dead from alcohol poisoning. A pentagram formed out of wine bottles encircled the man where he lay his body staged behind the altar in an abandoned church in some backwater Texas town. The channel flipped, and a female teacher that had been sleeping with a junior high student was found handcuffed in a tannin bed in a vacant New Jersey building. Again it flipped, but this one discussed a nationwide serial killer targeting people he felt fell outside the boundaries of normal and moral sexual behavior. Multiple small cameras and a note explaining why they were receiving judgment were found at each scene. The newsman reported that the FBI was calling this person the watcher, instructing anyone with information to call the authorities immediately. Claire's mouth hung wide open as she watched in horror, realizing she would be the next report once someone found her. Was the purpose of her life to become a statistic in a shocking story on the news? Hell no, she wasn't. She was going to break out or die trying. She stood and bit her lip as she fought through the soreness. She grabbed the largest steak knife she could find and hobbled to the door. She peeked out at the well. Thick fog still hung heavy in the air, and she looked out with a sense of deja vu. An eyeball jolted into view and stared back at her through the makeshift peephole. A thunderous slam erupted from the boards guarding the doorway. Claire shrieked and toppled backwards, her heart lodged in her throat. Someone was outside. No, not someone. The Watcher. He was outside her door right now. She slowly got back to her feet, never breaking eye contact with the wood slats in front of her. Her blood was ice water moving through her veins. A shiver swept through her body as she peered out the front door again, but she saw only the well and nothing more. She ran the steak knife over the face of the board. It was impossible to gain any real leverage into the board. Small flecks of dust began to fall to verify her progress. After an hour, the grip in her hand was limp as a dead fish. A pencil-thin, shallow, golden line of fresh pine wood against the weathered face of the board indicated she was in for a long process. She stepped away from the door as her stomach groaned. Had she eaten this morning? No, the TV stories distracted her, and then fear created a sense of urgency. She was here for the long haul, though. This asshole wants to frighten me, she thought. A pensive relief washed over her as she realized she had to work quickly, but this wouldn't be something she could rush. She took her time, ate, and drank a glass and a half of water. The remainder of the day was spent mindlessly sawing at the boards blocking the front door. After dinner, Claire made one last attempt at turning off the TV with the remote without success. It had been blaring static all day. With the exhaustion setting in, she just wanted it to be silent. She hit her forehead with her palm. Duh, I can hit the button on the TV.
She said as she walked over to the short entertainment center the 60-inch smart TV sat on. The noise stopped abruptly and the electronic snowstorm turned to black. She turned to her right and with a few short steps, she began to mount the stairs with her head hung low and groaned with each step. Her foot had just landed on the third step when the static came screaming out of the living room again. Claire winced as she turned to see the living room bathed in a soft bluish glow. The static jolted to a stop, but the light from the TV remained. Claire started to turn and step down, annoyed with this whole stupid thing. Good night, Claire. See you tomorrow, said a metallic modulated voice. She froze mid-step. A violent bang burst from the boards on the door again. She tripped over herself a couple of times as she scrambled and clawed at the carpet trying to reach the top of the stairs. Once inside her bedroom, she slammed the door behind her with a power she didn't know she had left. Fumbling with the door handle, she managed to find and turn the lock, then sprang to her bed. She gripped the cover she had pulled tight over her and felt like a kindergartner hiding from the boogeyman. She strained her ears to listen for something, anything. Silence reverberated against her eardrums. Trying to remain motionless, she drifted off to sleep and crashed hard. In the middle of the night, the sweat and stiff kink in her neck roused her. Pulling the comforter off her head and gasping for cool, fresh air, she never realized how stifling blankets could be. She surveyed the room and even the darkness gave way to pockets of more darkness. Claire imagined she saw a shadow figure standing across the room in the corner to her left. The shadow seemed to be crossing the room to the door. She glanced down at the floor, feeling for the survival radio. It had a signal flashlight built in, and she had to confirm she was alone for her sanity's sake. Her hand poked and prodded the carpet floor when she heard the creak groan from the door hinges. Her hand waved the wider path cutting through the air and finally found the plastic frame. Hoisting it up, she flipped the light on just in time to see the door stop just before the frame. Had it just been in her mind? Was her imagination starting to play tricks on her? No, damn it. I'm not giving in to this paranoia. I'm going to sleep, then cutting my way out of this damn house in the morning. She spoke to the house, intent on making it hear her. She rolled over and wheeled her terrified mind to let her rest. It felt like an eternity, but she drifted back to sleep. She woke to the silent stillness around her. Claire's tongue felt like a huge cotton ball in her mouth. Little cracks in her lips stung as she tried licking them. Trying to conserve water was taking its toll on her. Dehydration would not be far off. She had to drink more even if it cut the amount of time she had left. All she wanted was to know she was free from her home and to find her children. She looked out the peephole to see if the owner of the eyeball was outside. The constant haze began to make her wonder if she was a prisoner in time and space. Nothing outside the house seemed to change. Occasionally, a bird would chirp to break the oppressive silence. The sound was unusually jarring and would startle her for a second. The days were starting to meld together for Claire. Each morning, she would pour her two and a half glass water ration. This did leave her thirsty each night, but it was all she could do to stretch out her reserve. The hours would roll by with the monotonous up and down sawn motion. On the third day, just before her midday water break, she tried shaking off the light-headed feeling that was starting to take root in her head. She blinked rapidly, but her vision slid out of focus, and she toppled. Dehydration's hooks were in her, dragging her along like a fish on a line. When the ceiling stopped spinning, she got to her feet and staggered over to the fridge, taking a full glass of water out and chugged it. She grabbed one of the gallons of water and poured another glass full and drank it even quicker. 
What was the point in rationing my water if I can't stay on my feet to escape, she thought. She had to get back to work. If she could break through three of the boards, that would be just enough room to slither out of her prison. Claire imagined that this must have been what Andy Dufresne felt like in The Shawshank Redemption. It had been one of her favorite movies, and any time she caught it on TV, she had to finish it. However, Andy was getting three square meals a day and whatever he wanted to drink. She, however, was not so lucky in that department. The more she thought about the movie, the more she could relate. Both were being held for a crime they didn't commit. They shared the burden of using the meager tool to escape their bondage. As she reached down, she could feel the knife set into the wonky grooves where the constant sawing action created pregnant blisters on her palms and fingers. The blisters on her hands resembled sheets of packing bubbles. A week after she started sawing, she finally broke her first board with the meat hammer. She pushed against the edge of dehydration and insanity to ration herself and was down three gallons of water. She knew she had to get through the next board faster. She was about a quarter of the way through the second and third boards. It was a good start on the next two, but she still had the meat of the board to get through. Breaking through this board was worth a small celebration and put her one step closer to getting out and finding Dante and Bonnie. Using a cup and a half of boiling water, she cooked the remainder of the spaghetti she had in the cupboard and sprinkled a nice helping of cheese on top. Some pasta sauce would have been great, but of course the watcher hadn't given her any other liquids. The blisters on her hands stung while she held the fork like they had every night since she started, but the pain felt diminished due to her success. Can you believe it, Dante? I finally busted through that board using the meat hammer. Oh, and Bonnie, I could use your help applying the ointment and wrapping my hands tonight. Gotta have them in the best shape I can for tomorrow. Claire began to hear whispers around every corner of the house while she was working a couple of days ago. At first, the voices were sporadic, but it didn't take long for the frequency to increase. Was this a trick by the watcher or was her mind starting to unravel? That's great, Ma. Of course I'll help you with your hands. The voices may have only been in her head, but she heard them bouncing off the walls as though they were sitting at the table with her. She had taken up conversing with the pictures, those on the walls and the one leaning back to look up at her at the dinner table. If she was going to go crazy from voices in her head, they might as well be her kids' voices. At night, the house groaned and creaked in ways that hadn't existed the first week. It was as though the house was sentient and wanted to be a player in this sick and twisted game. Or maybe that was just her imagination too. With a feeling of accomplishment, Claire rested peacefully that night. Her mind swam in memories of Thanksgiving dinner surrounded by family and laughter. Christmases full of torn wrapping paper and happy children. Clark telling her she had spent too much that she shouldn't have bought it. Why do people always do that, she wondered. Why do they tell you what they want as a gift and then chastise you about the price and how you shouldn't have got it for them? It was by all accounts a dumb societal norm. The happy dreams gave rest to her weary mind and filled her cup with hope. She would free herself from this house, find her kids and husband to hear those sounds echo off the walls of their new home somewhere far from here. Claire woke up and stumbled into the master bathroom, which reeked of human waste in various states of decay. The smell of the most recent deposits layered over the older ones, making the air musty and thick, like walking through a jello mold. She exited the bathroom in a hurry and pulled up her underwear and pants as she walked. Closing the door, she replaced the towel at the bottom that helped trap the smell in. She could deal with it for the minute or two she had to each day, but she didn't want that smell penetrating the whole house. If she was honest with herself, the trips to the bathroom were becoming less frequent. She knew she was running low on food, and her celebration last night had cost her half a gallon between the pasta and her drinks. 
Her hands ached something fierce, and her headaches were virtually nonstop. Taking in less water than she needed each day had helped stretch her supply, but it was taking its toll on her body not to mention her mind. She looked at a recent picture on the wall from her anniversary trip to Rome, a slim black dress hugging her curves. She was no longer the 105 of high school, but after having two kids, she had made her peace with that. Staying around 150 was the goal. As she caught her reflection in the glass, the skinny look in her face stuck out to her. Cheekbones more pronounced, dark crescents under her eyes, and lips looking thinner. The reality of her reflection gave a sudden urgency to her need to escape. If I had been forced on this diet years ago, I could have been back to high school weight in no time. An empty giggle escaped her thin, deflated lips. Claire turned and made her way down the stairs, body aching with every footfall. She walked into the kitchen to smear some peanut butter on one of the last pieces of bread for breakfast and a small glass of water to wash it down. The astonishment poured over her like a bucket of ice water. All the food in the kitchen had been restocked. Fresh bread, pasta, crackers, and cheese. Whirling around quickly, she ripped the fridge door open but found one lone gallon of water sitting on the top shelf. Whoever had stocked the food had also cut her time to escape in half. As her mind began to grasp the fact that someone had been in here while she slept, the second bucket of ice water came crashing down on her. The shadow figure she had seen in the corner of the room. It wasn't her imagination, at least not completely. She ran to the door to find the board replaced, and her only view of the well through the drilled peephole. 4. Who's there? Her mind fractured further, small lines scattering in all different directions through her reality. She watched the solid footing around her fall away, leaving her alone on an island. Holding out hope that her family wasn't dead, the collateral damage of the grenade the Watcher had thrown into her life. Would he toy with them like he was with her? Or would he just dispose of them since they weren't the main target? The concern for her family had been bubbling under the surface, but signs of dehydration were as plain as the circles under her eyes. Between the constant headaches, whispers from every room and corner of the house, and blistered mitts for hands, her sanity was hanging by a thread. Her head swam as she began to lose her hold on the hope of escaping her home. Turning to the living room in short shuffling steps, she watched as the walls of the house began to turn on their sides. How odd. How is the house tipping when I don't feel it moving? She had never heard of a house standing on its side before. Claire's knees turned to jelly and buckled from the shock, feeling a sudden jolt from her shoulder and head hitting the ground. She lay on the carpet motionless, feeling like a passenger in her own body. Seven days trying to cut my way out with a steak knife. Her voice sounded distant and small. She might as well have been trying to free herself with a butter knife. Her hands ached and spots of blood were dried into the wooden handle of the knife. She lay on the ground, a vacant expression firmly rooted on her face. Eyes glazed over and unfocused her mind miles away. Suddenly the television clicked on, and black and white snow along with the hiss of white noise came blaring out. Even this did not bring her back from that far off place her mind was residing in right now. Claire. A tinny distorted voice came through the speaker. I have been watching, and I truly admire your willpower and spirit. They are two reasons why I choose you for this particular judgment. I cannot learn from those who give up at the first sign of trouble. Will you let this setback be the end of you? Her eyes were coming back into focus, and her mind was racing back in from that far off place. Who are you? Her voice replied, raspy and wooden. Why, I am the Watcher, Claire. 
She could hear the grin in his voice. This son of a bitch is truly enjoying her suffering. Do you get off on watching people suffer? Is that it? What kind of sick weirdo does that? Also, how are you talking to me through my TV? (laughs) A low chuckle came from the TV speaker as she gave a hard look around the back of the TV for anything she might not recognize. Did you like the news story compilation I put together for your wake-up call on day two? You have a smart TV, and using the Wi-Fi, I have linked to that TV. I can send whatever content I want to it, as well as receive feed from the various cameras I have set up. In simpler terms that you can understand, this is a webcam call to your TV, and you are the star. And my microphone has a modulation app that can keep you on your toes. To answer your next question, it is called voyeuristic disorder, and it's a branch of paraphilia. No, I am not conflicted at a disordered level, but we all have it to some degree. The teenage boy that wants to catch the hot neighbor girl undressing. The junior high girl that wants a peek in the boys' locker room after the big game. Everyone wants a peek. Everyone wants to catch a glimpse of something they aren't supposed to see. A superior tone cradled every word like a doctor would deliver a diagnosis. You call yourself the Watcher. Claire's bandaged and blistered fingers issued air quotes. That's gotta be a clinical disordered level of a voyeuristic disease, dumbass. An uncomfortable silence lingered in the air. What's the matter? Cat got you. Shut the hell up. If you do not want to lose your last gallon of water, I suggest you shut up. She realized she had gotten to him, whoever this watcher was behind the screen. There was a thinking person with feelings on the other side of the voice modulator, and this person did not like to be proven wrong or made to seem unintelligent. Now that is better. The cool arrogance of the voice returned. You are so quick to point out the flaws in others, but let us address yours instead. Does your husband know about your need of warriorism? If you can answer this question honestly, I may give you some of your water back. If you are truly honest about it, I may even take off the board you worked so hard to remove. Claire let the question sit for a moment as she weighed her options. I don't enjoy watching people. That does nothing for me. I'm not like you, you sicko. She huffed. She had managed to get herself to a sitting position with her back propped against the bottom of the couch. Let us check the board. Survey says... A buzzer screeched through the speaker. Sorry, that is the wrong answer. There was something oddly familiar in the mechanical way he spoke. Something subtle. It was like hearing a song on the radio a million times, but never remembering the artist. It's not incorrect. I never sat around and watched people for my pleasure. She barked. Maybe not, the murderous game show host said in a calm and cool tone. But do you deny letting people in video chat rooms watch you perform sexual acts for them? The shock from a taser gun would have delivered less of a jolt. She sat there in stunned silence. Whose tongue does the cat have now? If I am the watcher, that must make you the performer. I find it repulsive how easily people give up their moral compass behind a computer screen when they think they have anonymity. Claire tried swallowing, but her throat may as well have been the Sahara. I never did anything physical with them. Her voice trailed off as her head sunk. Rage flared from the speaker. And you think this acquits you? Would you do it in front of your husband? Would he find it harmless? Humans will always make excuses to justify the actions we take. We believe we are all free of wrongdoing. The truth is that we are screaming at someone else about why they deserve to drown while we ignore the bricks tied around our own ankles. It is only when we find ourselves at the bottom of the pool that we realize our guilt. 
Perhaps your last gallon of water and time will help you see clearly. With an abrupt scratching sound, the TV cut off. The large flat screen became a glossy blackness, reflecting a distorted view of her shock. A black window to a mirrored dystopian universe with nothing but darkness and emptiness. The moment stretched for what felt like an eternity to Claire. The first time she had gone to the website was out of curiosity, and she was content to sit back and observe. Soon, that no longer satisfied the urges, nor did it cure the loneliness she felt when Clark was away. She had tried being sexual with him over their video chats, but Clark always seemed like he was from another planet when they did, as though he didn't understand the protocols and social customs of this world. Sure, the sex was never incredible, but they had deeper scars that bonded them, so they had been okay with average sex when they said, I do. Claire had lusted and fantasized about Clark taking her with an aggressive primal passion. To show her through actions how hot his desire burned for her. She knew it would never happen though. She thought of how she would always start with the best of intentions, but the sessions with her husband always led to an argument. The first time she returned to the website was after an argument with Clark during a two-week business trip. Fueled by sexual frustration and anger, she found a 20-year-old college boy with big arms and a washboard stomach. It didn't hurt that everything below the belt made her jaw drop, too. She laid down the ground rules. He could never see her face, know her name or where she lived, and it would be a one-time thing. Claire found that she loved being the object of someone's lust and sexual desire. She knew they would never have her heart, or have her physically, but she could bring them to climax, something she could not do to her husband over their video chat sessions. While the guilt ate her in the beginning, it began to fade away with each time and each new person. It's just like watching porn, she thought. She had seen plenty of amateur videos posted on the internet. That was her performance any different, she thought. Now, as she sat in the living room in her guilt and shame, she knew she had cheated. She had wrapped a rotten apple in a pretty box with a pretty bow, but it was still a rotten apple. Clark was somewhere right now working to provide for their family, and she was boarded up in their home being forced to face the darkest sides of her soul. Would Clark arrive home to find her dead in their boarded up home, or was he already caught by the watcher? and dead himself. Would she die before she could admit her failings to him and beg for his forgiveness? She rose to her feet, bleary-eyed but lucid. She turned and looked across the living room to the front door and kitchen area. She staggered over to one of the chairs at the table and sat. Okay, Claire. You don't have the kind of time you did when you cut the first board, so how are you going to get out now? A thought hit her so hard she almost fell back off the chair. The watcher had come into the house without removing the boards, which means there is a way out. The basement. She startled at the overwhelming sound of her voice in the silence. Springing to her feet, she ran to the basement door and pulled it. The chain lock across the inside of the door snapped the door handle out of her hand as it caught. Claire ran back to the kitchen and grabbed the wooden coat rack which had doubled as her battering ram. While the battering ram idea hadn't panned out on the thicker boards on the front door, it might work as a pry bar. Claire must have repositioned the makeshift pry bar a half a dozen times before realizing the arms on top would have to be broken off before it would be narrow enough to fit through the opening. With her trusty meat tenderizer in hand, she brought the hammer down on the arms as close to the post as she could. Her heart was thudding wildly in her ears. The blisters on her hands ached each time the hammer made contact. One or two had popped for sure, but she focused on blocking out the pain. With a half-crazed, half-adrenaline-fueled surge of energy, she thrust the coat rack as far as she could between the frame and door. The rack caught after eight inches, jerking to a sudden halt and catching her in the ribs with the leg post. 
A sudden and involuntary painful shriek burst forth as her rib cracked. She wrapped her bandaged hands around the post, favoring her now cracked ribs and leaned back with all the force her weakened body could muster. The wood of the doorframe began to moan under the strain. Tiny surges of pain shot like small electrical zaps each time a blister on her hand popped from the pressure. The wood lever in her hands creaked while Claire leaned against the post, head thrown back. If the coat rack failed, no, she couldn't afford to think like that. The hardened aluminum chain was starting to give way. Claire could feel it. It wouldn't be long now. Wood splintered and flew as the middle of the coat rack exploded into shrapnel. If there was anything lucky about the timing, it was that she had looked up at the door momentarily, which means she had landed flat on her back, merely knocking the wind out of her as opposed to leaving her unconscious on the ground. As she lay on the floor, time stretching for eons, Claire's lungs failed to function. Struggling to regain the air that was ejected from her lungs, she felt like she was dying. Panic clawed at her mind, making rational thought impossible. This must be what it's like to drown, she thought. I'm going to suffocate right here on the floor from having the air knocked out of me. Then, with a great heave, the dam broke and air rushed into her lungs. <laughs> she didn't know air could feel this good. Her panic receded and returned to its quiet resting place in the back of her mind. The air pouring in her lungs lit up pain in her ribs like slowly blinking Christmas lights. Claire felt the weight of this moment on her shoulders. She knew that she wouldn't get another opportunity like this. She had caught the watcher off guard and planned to use his point of entry against him. Time was short. She knew she was being watched assessed and judged with every move she made. Somewhere most likely nearby, some sicko amused himself with her desperate struggle. I just need to get through this damn door, she thought. I'll worry about the next step after that. Grabbing the larger half of the shattered coat rack, she drove the sharp point into the center of the wood door. Her hands were bloody mittens in the bandages now. Numbness replaced the pain. Her brain couldn't comprehend what she was doing to them. Over and over, she drove the point into the door. A tattered hole was forming as she continued to thrust the point forward. She felt the blood racing and throbbing in her arteries. Thick bulges pulsed over her temples in rhythm with her galloping heart. Claire's vision narrowed to the door. Everything else fell away. Nothing existed in the world beyond this single door. She felt anger and rage, but those emotions existed apart from her body. Her mind and emotional being felt as though they were floating behind her and watching the events unfold. Her body was mechanically reproducing the stroke. Thrust, contact, remove, swing back, and thrust again and again. The pain in her joints, the fatigue in her muscles, and the dryness in her mouth were all just faraway concepts her body didn't recognize. She continued for 30 minutes, and it wasn't until her hand finally buckled that she realized most of the door was now splinters on the floor. She had worn the sharp point down to something that resembled a Q-tip. Weary, hands dripping blood from what remained of the bandages, she stumbled down the stairs, down into the darkness. 5. The Descent In the dank basement, the light from the half-window cast odd shadows throughout the room. She half expected some of the dark silhouettes to come to life and move like the shadowy figure from the corner of her room. Looking at the window, Claire believed it would be her best bet. The other door would be locked from the outside, and she didn't have it in her to break through another door. As she scanned the walls, she found an old wooden chair they had brought down to throw away but forgotten about. The back of the chair had loosened over the years and felt like it would come apart at any moment. 
pulling the chair and her weary body to the window, perched six feet above the floor. She looked up at the single pane of glass blocking her freedom. At this point, she may as well have been staring at the peak of Everest. Six feet felt like miles in her current condition. The sound of wood dragging across concrete bounced off every surface. Everything in her body screamed at her to sit down and rest. Everything in her mind screamed to break the window and get the hell out of this house. Claire found one of Dante's old lacrosse sticks and used the butt to punch through the glass. The sound of a window shattering had never sounded so amazing. Using the handle, she knocked out all the jagged pieces stuck in the frame. Looking at it from the ground, she knew it would be a tight squeeze, but she would make it. She had to make it. She positioned the chair to boost her to freedom. Placing her left foot on the chair and her left hand on the window, she forced her body up and threw her right hand out the window to catch grass or rock, searching for purchase. Pain fired through her arm. Something did take hold of her hand. Her eyes went wide with shock as she felt the white-hot lance of pain. A sheet of plywood measuring four feet by eight feet with nails methodically placed every half inch caught her hand. Several nails had broken the skin, making shallow homes in her flesh. She used her left hand to pry her skewered hand off the spikes before pulling her hands back through the window. She fell to the floor holding her right hand on the dust-covered floor. Claire laid on the dirty floor and sobbed, not for her hand, not even for her helplessness to get free from her house. She wept for not having the strength to resist temptation, for seeking satisfaction away from the man she had given her life and her heart to in marriage. There in the dim light of the basement, hands gnarled and bloodstained, she believed this must have been how the man crucified Jesus must have felt. As she laid on the floor thinking back to her first trespassing into the taboo, she recalled how she was so paranoid that Clark would notice her browser history deleted and question her. She was more paranoid that the website would show up on the browser history and she would have to answer questions about that. Initially, the guilt picked at her like a crow, but as she strode deeper into the cave of infidelity, her concerns began to melt away. Claire became less concerned about the browser's history and at times even forgot she had the site open on an active tab. The guilt dissolved and with it, a certain amount of righteousness filled that void. It wasn't her fault she had to turn to this. It was Clark's for not satiating her desire and making her feel desired. She wasn't an immoral person or a bad wife, just a victim of a marriage that seemed it lost its passion. The cool concrete floor she now rested on offered surprising relief from the pain of her wounds, even though the dust had choked up her breathing a bit as it resettled. Her wounds. Claire ran through the escalation of the event, right up to the moment she lay in now. Each time the loop restarted, she felt less like the victim and more like the villain. Each lap, she understood more and more that she had not been forced into her actions. They were of her own doing. She had now come to accept that she had some, if not most, of the responsibility for her situation. The weight of her guilt threatened to crush her into the concrete floor. The Watcher was merely the vessel delivering the karma she had earned. Claire's eyes scanned the room from her back looking for an answer on what her next move should be. Picking herself up off the floor, she climbed what may have well as been a mountain pass. Her legs wobbled and protested as she scaled the stairs out of the dungeon-like room. Walking to the bathroom on the lower floor, she removed the lid from the tank of the toilet. It was empty. She forgot she had used the toilet once before, and now only the water in the bowl was usable. Having confined all bowel movements to the upstairs bedroom allowed her to keep this water for reserve. She had planned on using it to drink if things got desperate, but the urgent matter of cleaning her bloody hands was the priority now. 
Claire dropped to her knees and slowly immersed her hands in the toilet bowl up to her wrists. Rubbing her hands together felt strange, as though she was rubbing raw hamburger together, pain lancing and shooting in all directions. She pulled her hands from the water, now stained red with her blood. She grabbed a tube of antibiotic ointment and created a blob the size of a small orange in her left palm. Dropping the tube on the counter, she rubbed the hamburger mitts together again. The pain seemed fresh and new. After creating an ointment coat over her hands, she wrapped them with the last of the extra gauze rolls from one of Dante's injuries. It would be a pain in the ass to peel them off, but her mind was shutting down. The exhaustion had taken hold. Claire scaled her way up the staircase to the bedroom and collapsed into a deep sleep. That night, she dreamed deep and lucid for the first time in years. She stood in her eight-year-old body staring into a vast whiteness that went on forever. As she stood in her white dress with a red and pink floral pattern on it, colors began to appear and take shape. It was as though she was standing before a giant movie screen watching memories from her life. Playing tag on her elementary school playground trying to catch the boy she was crushing on. Then it flipped to junior high and smoking weed behind the football bleachers. The next one came faster, high school graduation night. The memory scrolled up the giant screen with ever-increasing speed. It was like watching years of a social media feed zoom past her eyes. Claire caught glimpses but would lose the image a fraction of a second later. Her head was spinning and she felt like any moment she might puke her guts out all over the impeccable white floor. She squeezed her eyelids closed and dropped to one knee, putting a hand down to stop the world from whirling around her. Her tongue burst through her lips with a gagging sound. The insubstantial contents of her stomach rose in her esophagus. She grabbed a small trash can by the nightstand and hurled with all her might. Her abs contracted so hard they locked up for a split second. After three or four more dry heaves, she fell back into bed, dropping the trash can to the floor. Never want another dream like that. As long as I live, she said meekly, thinking that it may not be much longer. Claire rolled her aching body to the edge of the bed. Her hands were throbbing in pulses of soreness that started in her elbows and rippled downward, ending at her fingertips. Her legs were tight, and a large bruise had developed on her rib cage under her boob. Sitting there looking at each of the wounds on her body, she had nothing to show for it. She was no closer to escaping now than she was before getting her first blister. Shuffling her feet, she made it downstairs and took two large swigs of her last gallon. Gripping the handle and supporting the bottom lit both hands with fresh pain, but the dryness in her throat and thirst outweighed the pain. Placing the cap back on and setting it in the fridge, she stood in the soft glow of the small compartment light. Grabbing the sharp cheddar, she bit chunks straight from the block. She would have preferred it on crackers, but there was no way she was cutting it. She never wanted to see a steak knife again. Claire walked back down to the basement, taking care to avoid the splintered wood of the door. The last thing I need is a huge splinter in my foot, she thought. She was curious if any alterations had been made while she was knocked out and watching the giant dream movie screen. Nothing had changed. Probably because the watcher either knew she couldn't get out down there, or he knew the extent of her injuries, and that she was growing weaker with the water supply getting low. She strode past the window and climbed two stairs that sat below a pair of double doors that led to the backyard. Taking two steps up, she pressed her shoulder into them, but they barely budged. They were the kind you see for tornado sellers in movies like Twister, she giggled, figuring it would have felt stupid if they had just opened and given her a clear path to her freedom. Walking back up the creaky and dusty stairs was a bigger chore than she expected. After ascending the staircase, she made her way to the living room and took a seat on the couch facing the TV. Hey, watcher. 
Are you there? Nothing but silence. Damn it, I'm talking to you, you son of a bitch. The TV crackled to life. The constant snowfall on the screen would rival a New England blizzard in full tilt. The suddenness startled Claire even though she half expected it. Hello, harlot. The static field speaker distorted the flat, unamused and annoyed tone in the voice. Your most recent attempt to escape was quite entertaining to watch. The window in the basement was a nice idea, but I do not overlook details. If I was that careless, I would have been caught a long time ago. The police are stupid, though. If the different states would work together, I am sure they would be able to track me down. God is protecting me, though. I am cleansing this world of the sexually perverse and immoral. Mary Magdalene saw the error of her ways and changed her life. We have fallen so far from that. People cannot, or choose not, to see their immorality. The corruption has come so far that the things that were once immoral are now commonplace and acceptable. You believe that as well. You believed you were doing nothing wrong, harlot. Now you will reap your deserved punishment. Let me out of here. I'm tired of this bullshit game. I'm thirsty. My hands hurt like hell. And I want my kids and my husband back. I know you have them, now give them back to me. Claire's labored voice hissed with all the energy she could muster. Oh, I am truly sorry. You are tired of this. What did you call it? Bullshit game? Well, I will simply take the boards down and free you. I did not know I was inconveniencing you. I feel awful. The tone started almost sincere, but quickly grew sarcastic. Are you honestly that dumb or naive to think I would just let you go after all the hard work I have put into this? Do you truly believe you can avoid judgment and punishment with mere words? And not even remorseful or convincing words at that? I know what I did behind my husband's back was wrong, damn it. I know that when I tell him, he will never forgive me. I can understand that and live with that. I won't be happy to break the heart of a good man who has always taken care of me. But I can't atone for it if I'm dead. Please, just quit your damn groveling. Anger flashed red and hot. You think you can spin this to your benefit? That I would give you the chance to change? You are going to hell. Your soul will spend an eternity reconciling your shortcomings. Dante and Bonnie will not be far behind you. At the sound of her children's names, her eyes widened as much as humanly possible. A mother's worst fear confirmed in a single sentence. He was going to kill her kids. You keep your hands off my kids, you asshole! Claire dropped to her knees and crawled in front of the TV. The rage inside her flared up new and scorching hot. It was like someone had thrown a whole pallet onto a bonfire in her soul. Heat and pressure pushed around the edges of her eyes and desperation and panic churned her stomach. She wanted to smash the TV to vent all the fires of her rage on it. Both Dante and Bonnie have committed immoral acts as well. It is only fit that judgment be given on all of you and all of you taken from this world before you can taint any more innocent people. A ribbon of thin condescension ran through the watcher's voice. What the hell could my kids have done to warrant their deaths? Panic and astonishment poured over Claire again after the words left her lips. She had raised good kids, and she knew it. Wouldn't she have known that they were doing things they shouldn't be? Of course she would. Were you aware that Dante has been going to the lusty last strip club since the day he turned 18? Shock's silence reverberated off every wall. Furthermore, he has been dating one of the strippers, and on occasion they will invite one of her co-workers to join them in perverted sexual acts. Never mind the fact that they are not married. She felt like she could have been punched in the gut. 
How could this stranger know more about her own son's activities than she did? Let us discuss Bonnie now. His voice full of restrained joy, knowing he had stuck the dagger deep in her stomach and he was going to enjoy twisting it. Bonnie is also guilty of premarital sex. She has slept with four different boys from her high school and was recently pregnant. Claire felt like she had been hung from the ceiling and used as a punching bag for Mike Tyson. The blows came strong and heavy, one right after another. How had she not known her daughter was pregnant? Why didn't Bonnie trust her enough to confide in her? As her mind reeled about the news, some part of her was analyzing the sentence. Bonnie had been pregnant, not is pregnant. Somehow her eyes widened further and she brought her bandaged hands to her open mouth. The small amount of air left in her lungs was suddenly evicted, and her chest heaved compulsive spasms trying to bring the air back in. She told the boy she was screwing about the pregnancy, and he told her to take care of it. He wasn't ready to be a father, and it would ruin his chances at a scholarship if he had to miss time on the football field to change diapers. He gave her 350 bucks to get it done and never spoke to her again. An endless tunnel of deafening silence stretched on and on. Bonnie defiled herself with those dumbass boys and cut short a life growing inside her. For this, she must atone. The watcher's voice pounded her eardrums with the authority of a courtroom gavel. This was all a bad dream, Claire thought. One minute she was going to wake up in her bed with no boards on the windows or doors. Bonnie and Dante would be downstairs arguing over whose music sucked worse or what the funniest episode of Friends was over breakfast. Clark would be in the shower talking over one of his speeches for work or listening to a boring podcast on the waterproof speaker. All would be right in the world and all the imagined horrors would fade away as the dream haze burned off in the morning sun. We tried to raise them right, but I guess they could not overcome having a harlot for a mother. Her heart froze instantly. It felt as though someone had wrapped a belt around her ribs and pulled it tight. This will be the last time we speak. Dante and Bonnie will face their judgment. Goodbye, Claire. I hope you burn in hell and die of thirst there, too. Her mind fumbled for words, but her mouth found only one. Clark? Her strained voice forced out. The belt felt like it had moved from her chest to her throat, cutting off all airflow in and out. The TV cut off sharp and harsh. Claire screamed. She screamed and screamed and screamed. Her vocal cords grated on each other until no sound came out. She stared into the glossy black TV glass, waiting for a response from her husband, father of their children, and captor. None came. She knew she was helpless. Unless she could get out of the prison cell that was once her home, she would not be able to help her children. In the state she was in, she didn't believe there was a way to escape. Her hands were raw. Her rib cage was bruised. Her mind and soul were fractured. Finding her feet, she staggered her way over to the fridge and down the rest of the water. It was cool and refreshing and satisfied the thirst that had been gnawing at her. It tasted like death. Claire shuffled her way over to the couch and collapsed on it. A memory of Dante popped into her head. She was walking through one of the large box stores that are a one-stop shop. Groceries, toys, automotive, and everything in between, all in one convenient location. Dante was asleep in his car seat, which was resting on the handles and back seat of the car. He looked so peaceful asleep like that. She hadn't realized that she had stopped walking and was just standing there admiring this life she had grown inside her. Then the memory started to warp. The color drained from Dante's face, and his skin took on a rough, stiff texture. The warmth left his tiny hands. 
and she felt like she was holding some frozen doll hand. The car seat had slowly warped into a coffin before her eyes, but she hadn't noticed a change. A tiny blue suit now clothed his lifeless body. She stared in horror as people walked around the lifeless baby in the coffin on aisle 13. Claire's eyes flashed open and she sucked in a panicked breath. She was on the couch and in her house again. Dante was going to die, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. His father, of all people, was going to kill him. She wondered what horror she would see if she thought about Bonnie, and she shuddered. There was nothing to do now but wait for death. She had never been much of a religious woman, but she thought there must be some penalty for killing yourself. Some great cosmic being like Karma, God, and Buddha, or Muhammad out there keeping things in balance. She wondered if this balanced all the wrong she had done in her life. Did it atone for the cheating and lying and all the other things she never thought to say sorry for? Claire thought if she was lucky, it would balance out, and she would get to see her kids somewhere over the rainbow or wherever lay beyond this place. There had to be a place for monsters too, right? Not the boogeyman or vampires, but the real monsters that killed strangers and their own families alike. There had to be a place where people like Clark went after their time of terror ended too, right? Time passed and Claire was unsure of just how many days it had been. She had been plagued with horrible visions of the kids being killed by Clark in countless scenarios, each worse than the previous. She wondered if he had already done it, but she doubted it. After all, he is the Watcher. He is going to want to watch it all unfold. One particular memory of Bonnie kept replaying in her head like it was stuck on a loop. Bonnie had been about six years old and she was in the backyard playing with her wooden toy house. Clark had spent six months making it for her by hand. The house had a small kitchen and a living room area with a hollow chimney. She had always told Clark she needed some of his charcoals in the fireplace so she could keep her house warm. He always told her that if her guests were cold, they could warm themselves in the big house and smiled warmly at her. The memory would distort into him scooping hot coals from the fire pit and dumping them down the wooden chimney. He boarded up the doors and windows just like her current predicament, but there was one gap big enough for Bonnie to reach through. Claire always came out after the toy house was fully engulfed in flames. Bonnie's blistered hand sticking out of the window frantically reaching for anyone or anything. Her screams barely heard over the crackle and roar of the fire. Black snowflakes of skin blowing off in the breeze. Clark sipped a cold beer, flipped burgers, and whistled the Andy Griffith show tune without a care in the world. A wild and crazed look in his eyes with a twisted smile crawled all over his face as he looked over to his wife. Bonnie's hand would strain and then fall limp, and the screams would fade while the fire roared feeding on their dead daughter's body, a morbid funeral pyre for a child. In the vision, her feet were always locked in place. She could never move to help, never grab the hose to put the fire out. It was torment beyond words. She had seen ghosts of the children in the house. She didn't know if that was because they were dead or if she was hallucinating from the dehydration. The ghosts were the appropriate ages for Dante and Bonnie, but they were mean. They berated her for being a bad mother and cheating on their dad. Bonnie screamed at her mother for never getting the hint during the week she couldn't hold down food. Dante raged about her not believing in him enough to let him join the military straight out of high school. It was her fault he was always at the strip club. If he couldn't find acceptance in his mother's eyes, he would find it from some other woman. Claire wanted nothing more than for the vicious cycle of twisted memory dreams and ghost hallucinations tormenting her to end. She was reaching her breaking point fast. Her hands had healed slightly and the bruises to her cracked ribs were all but gone, but the fractures to her mind and heart had grown wider. 
Claire's throat felt like a tube of sandpaper swallowing tablespoons of coarse salt. She was quickly approaching the tipping point where she didn't care about the karmic debts she would incur from suicide. Maybe she would see Clark when he got there, and she could turn the screws on him, pay him back for all of it. 6. Judgment Day The boards to the door had been cut. The path to the well now lay wide open. Claire took one uncertain step, thinking if she moved too fast she would destroy the illusion. She put one questioning and weary step in front of the other while her right hand had a death grip on the handrail. She slowly stepped over the pile of boards, expecting Clark to have a trap waiting for her just outside. There wasn't, and she didn't see him. Claire's fight-or-flight reflex flooded her body with adrenaline, and she felt strength return to her legs, and soon she was running for the well. She saw nothing but the cobblestone wall and its much-needed liquid for her parched throat. Everything else ceased to exist. She was five feet away, now three feet, now two. Her big toe caught on something jutting out of the ground, and before she knew it, she was off balance falling forward. The top of the cobblestone wall caught her high on the thigh, and she pitched forward violently. Her hands desperately reached for anything and something grabbed her wrist hard. Clark stood holding a gun at her face. I will not let you get off so easily. Your judgment will be by my hands, not by your clumsiness. Easy? She hissed. You think this was easy? Claire delivered a kick as hard and swift as she could to his groin. Clark doubled over and squeezed the trigger as a reflex. There was an explosion followed by a high-pitched ring in her ears. She didn't feel pain from anywhere, just the ringing. He was on his knees in agony hitting the butt of the gun on the ground. She kicked his hand and the gun went sailing out of reach. His head snapped back from a solid kick to the forehead. Claire scrambled over to the gun and turned it on him. He rose slowly to his feet. <sighs> Nothing can postpone your judgment, whore. Nothing. Not even the gun in your hands can stop me, he hissed. Claire stood there, bewilderment written all over her face. An evil smile crept across Clark's face, and the wider it got, the larger the pit in her stomach grew. You think you can stop bullets, Clark? Well, let's find out. She closed her eyes and pulled. Nothing happened. No click, no loud bang, nothing. The trigger didn't even budge. She looked quizzically at the gun. Her husband lunged at her and grabbed her hands around the gun and squeezed. A sudden scream sent birds in the nearby tree line scattering. He clamped down on the gauze wrappings and white-hot pain shot up her arms. Releasing the firearm, her knees buckled as she collapsed on the ground. Claire tucked her hands under her arms and whimpered in pain. I flipped the safety on you, dumb slut, Clark sneered at her. I thought you might do something stupid and you sure did. He grabbed Claire by the arm and got her on her feet. You want water so bad, harlot? He walked her back to the edge of the well. <sighs> Drink up in hell, bitch. Clark shoved his wife into the well. She scrambled and reached for anything to grab a hold of. All she caught was the bucket. She turned and fell face first down the well with the bucket and rope trailing behind her. After seven feet, her face hit the water and the sound of the splash bellowed out of the well, as if it had come from a bullhorn. The watcher stepped closer and peered down the well. She burst through the surface and struggled to find a nook in the walls to dig into to keep her head above water. He watched on as the chore of keeping herself afloat became more difficult. The whore would die in the well, and he wouldn't even have to dispose of the body. 
It was all tied up in a nice little bow. He watched as Claire's head sank beneath the water, followed shortly after by her hands. He turned from the well content. Maybe I should go play the lottery today. He held the thought in his head for a moment before dismissing it. Time to go check in on Dante and Bonnie. The hunger should be ravaging them by now. Clark climbed into the family station wagon and drove out of the gate to the 20-acre piece of property they owned in the hills outside of Cordelline, Idaho. He was so happy he didn't know where he wanted to go to celebrate his success. Judgment had been served to Claire. Cries of pain came from the open laptop on the passenger seat. Clark looked down at Dante and Bonnie as a toothy grin grew on his face. Maybe I will go get some pizza. It's always been one of their favorite dishes. The watcher drove towards town, heart racing with excitement for the next part of his plan. And that was The Well by author DJ Montano. I have it on good authority that this story is to be continued. Want more? Go ahead and let them know in the comments, y'all. A little about the author. DJ Montano began writing in 2019. He fell in love with horror stories from the classic scary stories to tell in the dark book series. Horror games like Silent Hill and Resident Evil fueled his love for terror. Through the suggestion of his wife, he found writing and enjoys picking the dark and twisted corners of his brain for other pleasure. I mean, for others' pleasure. <sighs> he has multiple stories published on the Chillin' Tales Network and Amazon. He is currently working on his first novel. Check out DJ Montano on Amazon, friends. The Oriental, Frozen Souls, and The Elevator are all available on Kindle and in paperback. You can also find David Montano on Twitter at IntoDarkness49 and on Facebook as David Montano. Thanks, David. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, harlot. I've got no problem with loose women personally, and I'd just hate to leave you thirsty. I'd like to give a special shout out to my newest patrons. So, Donnie Grimm, Loretta Bennett, Daphne Rousseau, Kathleen Kramer, and Big Tim Finley. Thank y'all from the bottom of my heart. It really means a lot to me, and it really helps out. I really love what I do, y'all, and patrons like you help make this possible. So, thank you. Donnie Grimm, Loretta Bennett, 
Daphne Rousseau, Kathleen Kramer, and that crazy mofo, Tim Finley. Hey, Tim. So may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Follow the signs to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood and you'll get right where you need to go. I promise. And as always, go fuck yourselves. <laughs>